So good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the British Academy. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Paul Collins. I'm the current chair of council for the British Institute for the Study of Iraq. And it's my duty and honour to welcome everyone here this afternoon. We're here, of course, to remember and celebrate the life and achievements of an outstanding archaeologist, museum curator, and defender of Iraq's cultural heritage. Dr. Lamia al Gailani Ware strove throughout her career to promote and protect that heritage, and especially to make it popular and accessible. Her work became extremely difficult, but all the more vital with the disasters of 2003 and the subsequent decades of destruction and division in Iraq. She provided unceasing and unwavering effort in fostering and sustaining academic and personal links between scholars in the UK and Iraq, and was absolutely instrumental in laying strong foundations for museum and cultural heritage professionals to play an important part in creating a brighter future for Iraq. As you will all know, Lamia was very closely associated with the British Institute for the Study of Iraq. She was a lifelong supporter and its only honorary lifetime member. She was also the recipient of the Institute's highest honor, the Gertrude Bell Memorial Medal, awarded in 2009 for outstanding services to Mesopotamian archeology. span Her wise counsel was invaluable and we are profoundly grateful for all she did. This afternoon, we will hear about some of Lamia's wide-ranging achievements through reminiscences by close friends and colleagues. I am very pleased that we are able to share these with members of her family who join us, and I thank them very much for being here. And I thank you all for coming together to pay tribute to this remarkable woman. So to begin the afternoon, I would like to invite Mr. Nazem Mirjan, the Deputy Ambassador from the Iraqi Embassy, to say a few words. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Paul, Dr. John uh, Curtis. Uh, today, we are gathering together to remember one of the remarkable and greatest Iraqi women. I believe all the words and all when we talk about this great lady, it will be not enough about what she did and her efforts. And I believe all together we are, uh, our feelings and our thoughts with her families and uh, all her close friends. She was a big loss for all of us. And let me start my formal speech, please. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Firstly, I would like to thank the British Institute for Study of, Iraq, Study of Iraq for holding this special memorial event for one of the most remarkable Iraqi women, Dr. Lamia Al Gailani. And I'm honored to be here with you today to remember this great Iraqi archaeologist. Dr. Lamia Al Gailani was born in Baghdad and complete, completed her education in Iraq. And then uh, in the UK. She specialized in ancient Mesopotamia, antiquities, and her doctoral study of old Babylonian cylinder cells was considered a landmark in the field. She was none 
for the maintaining links between British and Iraqi archaeology and for her, for her efforts to, pre, uh, to preserve cultural heritage in the aftermath of the Iraq War 2003. She was also closely involved in the reconstruction of the National Museum of Iraq and the founding of Basra Museum. Dr. Al Gailani died in Amman, Jordan, of stroke in January 2019. At the time of her death, she held a research fellow, fellowship at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, where she was writing a book on the history of the Iraqi Museum. She was the only lifetime honorary uh, uh, member of the British Institute for the Iraqi study, uh, for the study of Iraq and was awarded its uh, Gratuit Bell Memorial Gold Medal in 2009. Ladies and gentlemen, let me take this opportunity to talk about several women, Iraqi women, and the role of the Iraqi women with, which was the uh, Lamia Gailani, one of the uh, remarkable one of them, and the efforts of those women. And, I, and uh, briefly, some major Iraqi women that had played major roles in the Iraq society and had significant impact in various fields, such as medical, education, law, politics, science, and more. And starting from 1920s, when Asma al-Zahawi and other women established Layla Journal, addressing women's rights to, educate, uh, to education and employment. Ms. Nazih al the first woman in the Arab world to gain high position at the Ministry of the Municipalities. She, she also headed the Union, uh, the Union of Women Rights in Iraq in 1952. In the arts field, there was Naziha Al-Salim. On the other hand, we had most significant poet, Nazik al-Malaike, who was raised in, all, uh, in a well-cultural family. In, archi uh, in architect, we have Zoha Hadid. In the medical field, we have uh, Lihav uh, Ghazali. She is a professor in clinic genetics. Last but not least, we have to mention an example of our recent days heroes. Aliya Saleh Khalaf, known as Um Qusay, the woman who saved more than 50 soldiers from uh, speeches massacre uh, slaughtered by Daesh in 2014. She was awarded by the first United States Lady Melina Trump as one of the most brave women in the world. Distinguished guests, Dr. Laimea Al Gailani left a special place for herself in our mind, and we will always remember her. Let me thank the British Institute again for all the efforts to engage with the Iraqi authorities for the archaeology and uh, keeping the heritage of Iraq and to, to send uh, a letter to all the world about Iraq and make the people know everything about the heritage of Iraq. Thank you very much.
Um, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, um, it was my privilege to know Lamia for uh, nearly 50 years, from the time when she came to London to work on her PhD with uh, Barbara Parker, uh, later Lady Mallowan, at the Institute of Archaeology. And her doctoral dissertation, completed in 1977, was on studies in the chronology and regional development of old Babylonian cylinder seals, and was published in 1988 in Malibu, um, California. Um, before coming to London, she'd studied briefly in the University of Baghdad, and later at the Universities of Cambridge and Edinburgh, gaining a, a BA and an MA, uh, respectively, and she worked for a short time at the Iraq Museum. Now, as is well known, Lamia came from a very distinguished uh, Iraqi family that uh, traces its descent from Abdul Qadr al Gailani, a 12th century mystic who founded a, a Sufi religious order. And his mausoleum uh, in Baghdad. Um, which sadly actually was at the, which is at the center of a religious uh, complex uh, that includes a, a mosque uh, and a library, um, was sadly uh, badly damaged by a car bomb attack in 2007. Uh, another ancestor, Abdul Rahman al Gailani, was the first prime minister of Iraq in 1920 to 1922. Um, very appropriately, I think, um, after she passed away, Lamia's body was taken from Amman um, to Baghdad, where there was a ceremony in the Iraq Museum, following which she was laid to rest in the Gailani Shrine. Well, after coming to London, uh, Lamia made it her home for the rest of her life, although there were frequent visits uh, to Iraq and latterly um, to Jordan. After her marriage to Jordanian businessman George Ware, she settled in a house in Valley Drive in Kingsbury in North London, and there uh, they were generous hosts entertaining uh, a wide range of friends, uh, British and Iraqi, and often putting up visiting academics um, from uh, Iraq. Many of you will have memories of evenings at their house with delicious Arabic food served from a large circular table uh, in the dining room and animated conversation, sometimes political, sometimes academic, sometimes personal, but always of absorbing interest. One memory I cherish of, is of seeing the foxes in the garden, which Lamia unashamedly put food out for every night. Uh, in spite of her busy social life and involvement in many sorts of activities in London and attending international conferences, her academic work was by no means neglected. In fact, just the opposite. She established herself as one of the leading experts in the world on Mesopotamian cylinder seals, that were used to uh, impress designs on uh, cuneiform tablets, along with Dominic Collin, who I'm pleased to see is uh, here with us this evening, uh, Edith Parada, and of course, um, Lady Mallowan. She published widely in this field, both in English and Arabic, uh, and more widely about Mesopotamian art and archeology. span She even found time to publish herself under the imprint of Nabu Publications, a series of uh, volumes, the series is called Eduba, that were largely intended to make available to Western scholars important primary material that had been published in Arabic. And she also distributed in Europe on behalf of the Iraqi State Board of Antiquities and Heritage uh, copies of the periodical uh, Summa. And nor were uh, Lamia's interests confined to ancient Iraq. Uh, she, uh, for example, photographs of uh, old Baghdad, um, people like Gertrude Bell and the history of the Iraqi royal family were also subjects for her uh, of great fascination. 
Well, as you've already heard um, from Dr. Collins, throughout her career, Lamia was a loyal and much valued supporter of the British School of Archaeology in Iraq, which later became BZ, and she was its only uh, honorary lifetime member. And she contributed to many uh, BZ initiatives, projects, and conferences. Uh, and as you heard, in 2009, was awarded its Gertrude Bell Memorial Medal um, for outstanding services to Mesopotamian archaeology. Uh, latterly, she was an honorary research associate at University College London and then the School of Oriental and African Studies. And as you heard, from September 2016 until July 2017, she was a visiting fellow at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, uh, where she was writing a history of the Iraq Museum. Uh, sadly, um, that project was unfinished, uh, which is a matter for regret, as Lamia had an unrivaled knowledge um, of the turbulent history of the Iraq Museum, and it would indeed be difficult for somebody else to pick up the reins. But hopefully she's left behind some drafts and notes which somebody can turn into a publication. Like many other people, Lamia was deeply shocked when the Iraq Museum was looted uh, in April 2003. And particularly distressing for her personally was the theft of the Iraq Museum's entire collection of 7,000 seals, only a small number of which have since been recovered. And thereafter, she worked tirelessly with the Coalition Provisional Authority and other bodies to rebuild morale in the Iraq Museum, to organize training for the staff, and to coordinate efforts uh, to retrieve the stolen antiquities. For the last 10 years of her life, Lamia was much involved in the project to establish a new museum for Basra. There had previously been a museum for Basra uh, in, in an attractive courtyard house on Ashar Creek, but it had been looted in the aftermath of the first Gulf War, and it closed in 1991. In 2008, the British Army, in consultation with the Iraqi authorities, suggested that a former palace of Saddam Hussein should be converted to become a, a new museum. But when the army withdrew in early 2009, the funding for this project was still not in place. So a steering committee, soon to become a charity known as the Friends of Basra Museum, was established in London to complete the project. From its inception, Lamia was a key member of this group, and her role has been crucial throughout. Visiting Basra, working closely with the director of the museum, Khatan Al-Abid, and liaising with authorities uh, in Baghdad. Indeed, at the time of her death, she was returning to the UK uh, from, via Amman from Baghdad, where she had been selecting objects for Basra Museum and arranging for them to be recorded and packed prior to transportation to Basra. With the assistance of a generous grant from BP, it was possible to open uh, one gallery dedicated to the history of the Basra Museum in September 2016, and subsequently the charity secured a grant from the Cultural <coughs> Protection Fund that has enabled the three remaining galleries to be fitted out, and the entire museum opened on 19th March. It's sad very sad that Lamia didn't live long enough to see this day, but she was there in spirit as throughout the opening ceremony, a large photograph of Lamia was on the stage uh, next to the microphone. I think more than anything, uh, Lamia was a wonderful human being. In all the years I knew her, I never heard her speak badly about anybody. Even if they had disappointed her, or if she'd been let down in some way. She gave freely of her time and was always ready, as you've heard, to act as a liaison person 
between colleagues in Iraq and scholars in the UK, or to give helpful advice to people wanting to work, uh, on, uh, work in Iraq. On this account, many people beat a path to her door. She was welcoming, generous, and public-spirited. We extend our deepest sympathies to her three daughters, Nora Al-Gailani, uh, Asa Al-Gailani, and Hassan Well. That's a great account of some of Lamia's achievements, and I've got a few personal memories and impressions, rather. I met Lamia first when we were at Cambridge together, and again, and again in the early 1960s when she put her studies to use. She was one of a fantastic generation of Iraqi women who did not accept any limitation on what they could do. She insisted on going into the field as a real archaeologist, something that only men there had done previously. And she talked with excitement about her unique discoveries, like an old Babylonian cobblesmith's workshop. Lamia came with privilege, but she soon earned the friendship and respect of fellow workers high and low. This was the start of the academic research that continued throughout her life, but was only one aspect of her personality. Lamia and her cousins, Selma and Nuha al-Rali, both also highly distinguished in later years, were very kind towards the small, untidy group of archaeologists such as myself who then lived in the British school in Baghdad. They entertained us with unstinting generosity and introduced us to their friends. Come the marmalade season, and Lamia arrived with vast quantities of oranges from some Gailani family estate. When we went to excavate far away at Nimrud, Lamia kept an eye on our requirements. For some reason, there was a demand for Danish blue cheese, and she arrived with a substantial supply from Orozdibak, the one Baghdad store that could provide it. In the 1970s, with political change, Iraq suffered an exodus of young, educated, and capable people. Archaeologists we had known in the 1960s all seemed to be taking jobs elsewhere in the Gulf area, Saudi, Sudan, or finding new careers altogether. Lamia, too, came to live in Britain, but she brought Baghdad with her. Eventually, behind the unobtrusive frontage of that house in Valley Drive, she, George, and Hassan created an alternative Middle East. You, you passed the front door and were in a room suspended between England, Jordan, and Iraq. It was in that house that my son William, who, like other members of my family, is sorry not to be here this evening, discovered the possibilities and complexities of computing. Then you entered a garden with a surprising view of open country beyond that you could well imagine was a Gailani estate. Your fellow guests were people of many backgrounds, but of one thing you could be sure, that they were the kind of people that it was a pleasure to meet. The visits ended with mountains of Iraqi food, cooked, of course, at home. But while some Iraqi exiles could not go back, Lamia always did. She was forever 
coming and going between London, Amman and Baghdad. Nothing would stop her. Her family had survived Mongol, Persian, Ottoman and British rule over Baghdad and she would not be intimidated now by the ruling party of the time. Later, when the kidnappings began and she was a potential target, she joked about the prospect. Lamia was always finding opportunities rather than obstacles. That house became the one place outside Iraq, as John has said, where one could get the antiquities journal, Suma. She and George started a publishing company. When Western archaeologists failed to learn Arabic, she arranged for the translation of Arabic excavation reports into English. Then she and Salim al-Alusi wrote a book on the early Arabs. She wanted to make some of the results of Western scholarship available in Arabic. In considering what I should say at the launch party for that book 20 years ago, I found myself drawing the analogy of a bridge, of Lamia as an intermediary between different areas of experience. Recently, when I read Noura's account of the Gardiria Foundation in Baghdad, where Sufi, Sunni and Shia interests have come together in an institution providing, among other things, food and free electricity in one of the poorest ethnically and religious mixed areas of Baghdad. I realized how Lamia El Gailani, sorry, I'm pressing it in the wrong place, and Lamia as a Gailani had inherited and embodied that ideal. She was also, of course, a bridge between past and future. She did not quite know Gertrude Bell, Miss Bell, but her grandparents did. When the prehistoric Waka head disappeared from the Iraq Museum in 2003, she said it was like losing one of the family. She had an unfailing sense of historical continuity. For this reason, she even wished to ensure the preservation in the museum of some statues of Saddam. She was thrilled a year back to meet some members of the Jewish community that left Iraq in the 1940s. They still spoke and acted like the older Iraqis she had known as a child. A major project of hers which I hope can be completed, was to write that history of the Iraq Museum itself. Typically, last year, when Lamia was walk, knock, knocked over walking on the pavement, she did not complain. There she lay in the hospital bed, emphatic that it was an accident, that no one was to blame for what had happened. She was full of praise for her medical treatment and anticipated with apparent amusement the prospect of the metal splint in her leg setting off airport security alarms. When she came out of hospital, in no time she was walking again. Lamia seemed to know everyone and everything, important and unimportant alike, connected with Iraq. Yet, if she was ever told quite how high, highly she was regarded, I expect she will have laughed with characteristic modesty. I shall miss her as an exhaustible source of knowledge and wisdom, but I shall miss most of all her friendship, tolerance and optimism, and I'm sure that there I can speak for most of us, all of us.
pictures and photographs. Thank you. I love that one. Um, I'm Jane Araf. I'm a correspondent. I've covered Iraq for, oh, since the 1990s. Um, for National Public Radio now in the States, but before that for CNN. But I knew Lamia before I knew Iraq. You know, as archaeologists, as a lot of you are, you, you all know the depths of countries like Iraq, the way few people do. But when I met Lamia and her family and her friends, it was an absolute revelation. How's that? Okay. <laughs> so here was this, that doesn't sound right either. Is that working? How about that? All right. Um, yeah, dinner parties seem to be a theme here because I got to know her in the 1990s in Jordan. And there would be these evenings that I think back on as absolutely enchanting because they were full of sparkling conversation and fascinating topics. And these Iraqis I could never have imagined, particularly the women, the ones who defied convention. They were original, they were funny, they were passionate. And Lamia was so much all of that. A lot of these pictures are from the Iraq Museum, and that will be one of my enduring memories of my reporting career, going through the museum with Lamia. She seemed to feel that almost every statue was a personal friend. She had this incredible connection to the objects there, because for her, they weren't just objects. They were proof of, of ingenuity. And she seemed to feel very personally that it was Iraqi ingenuity. She would repeatedly say, we, look at this amazing site that was made out of clay. Weren't we ingenious? And then she would catch herself and say, well, I don't mean we, I mean them. But she actually did sort of think that it was we. Um, one of the last times that I was in the museum with Lamia, that's actually her going through photographs of Miss Bell. She discovered those in the archives. That was another passion of hers, as you know. She was passionate about so many things and accessible. You know, one of the wonderful things about her was that she treated everyone the same. Whether it was the museum cleaner or cabinet ministers, they were all on the same level. One of the last times I was in the museum with her, she was um, trying to get objects on loan for the Busra Museum. And she would say, why are they being so stingy? Because she was negotiating over every bead. And she would, they would say to her, well, you can have this bead or that bead. And she'd say, I want all of them. Because, you see, she wanted to string a necklace. And she said, because that's what people like. Because Lamia knew what people liked. You know, I never, in the, in the last story that I wrote about her, um, because Lamia was someone very special and someone very unusual, I wavered over whether to mention that she had married a Christian, which is among some circles still controversial. And I decided not to. And then I spoke to a colleague of mine who had met her once and she said, oh, well, Lamia said to me, you know, I rode a bicycle, I married a Christian, I didn't care what anybody thought. <laughs> and that kind of summed her up. That was part of the magic of Lamia. And she was absolutely magical. You know, every time I got together with her, every time she took me around the museum, I felt incredibly lucky to be in her presence, actually, with no exaggeration. She was absolutely extraordinary. She pushed, as you might know, for the opening of the Baghdad Museum on a Saturday. Now, that kind of sounds like a no-brainer. Previously, until then, though, it was closed during the weekend, so very few people could go to see it. Um, but she had it open on Saturday. Uh, she often joked that they should do other things to attract people, like have kebabs in the front yard and that sort of thing. But it was open on Saturday, and I think, I like to think of all the people, all the Iraqis who go to that museum on a Saturday now because of Lamia. And I like to think of them looking at her cylinder seals because those seals that she put together in 1966 in an exhibit are still there. She showed them to me recently and she showed me some of her favorites. And again, it was, as, it was really as if she was seeing them for the very first time. She was so in love with them. And she noted that one of them was upside down and she laughed about it because of course she had this fantastic laugh. So 
when I think now of part of Lamia's legacy, which is huge and grand in many ways and personal in so many other ways, I think too of, of the legacy that she left that people won't even realize, but it will live in Iraqi kids who can go to the museum on a Saturday and see her cylinder seals and one of the imprints still upside down. And I think she would have laughed about that too. Thank you, everyone. Over the past few days, I've been trying to think, trying to remember how long when I first, how long I've known Lamia and when I first met her. And to be honest, I really can't remember. It's more than 20 years, less than 30. And I've been feeling that was a rather long time and still um, Julian uh, started to talk and made me realize that really I am uh, known her for a fraction of the time that many of you have and have known a fraction of her as a person than many of you have. So I feel very humbled to be standing here today. But I think what I represent, perhaps, is Lamia's informal network of students. Lamia, of course, never had a formal uh, teaching position, but she was the, one of the world's greatest mentors. As you can see here from this, this is one of... I went through thousands of photographs looking for um, things that typify Lamia. And I think this, her, her in the center of a multi-generational, um, multinational um, group of everyone from graduate students to sort of senior professors really sums her up. So I wanted to talk, just briefly talk about um, three moments with Lamia in Iraq, um, how she's influenced me. But I also wanted to give the, the final word to Iraqi colleagues, as I'm just back from Baghdad. And I spend a lot of time in Baghdad these days, and I know, I know for certain that if I hadn't, that first encounter with, ba with Baghdad hadn't been with Lamia um, 18 years ago, that I really would not be doing what I'm doing today. So I don't have any pictures of Lamia in Baghdad that first time I was there with her. It was the first generation of, of digital cameras. Do you remember those really old clunky things where you put a little card in and you could take about 30 photographs? Um, I was part uh, of uh, a large group of people, in fact, that some of you may be in, in the room today, um, when we were part of an international conference to celebrate 5,000 years since the invention of writing in Iraq. Now, I'd started to study um, Mesopotamia as a graduate student in 1990. So 11 years later, th throughout all the sanctions years, this was the first time uh, I had the opportunity to um, see Iraq for myself, visit archaeological sites, meet many Iraqi colleagues, though I'd met several um, at conferences and, and here in London over the years. And that certainly would have happened all without Lamia's presence. But what made the difference to me, what made Iraq a real place, Baghdad a real place, is that she took us out. So these were the days of the secret police of the Mahabharat. But these were also the final days of the, of the Mahabharat. And they all went home at 10 o'clock in the evening. And that's when party time began. So we would pile into a taxi with Lamia in the front seat telling the taxi driver where to go. And we would go and explore Baghdad's nightlife. It was really quite something for an impressionable young woman. And um, so the, uh, she was particularly uh, interested in taking us to see old Baghdad. Um, so you can see here one of the, the heritage houses that had become um, uh, an, uh, an antique shop. Not antiquities, but sort of, um, uh, sort of Ottoman and um, Mandate era um, rugs and, and metalwork, etc. And one time in the day also she took me to the souk to see, see the copper market and introduced me to lots and lots of, of Iraqi colleagues. So that was a really foundational moment. That was the point at which 
Iraq was no longer a set of images on the television screen or on slides or in books, became a real living, breathing city for me. At that point, I wasn't terribly bothered that my camera could only take 30 images at once. I thought, this will be the first of many. I'll be back many times. At that point, we thought that sanctions would be lifted pretty soon and that life would return to what had been normal. Of course, this is only um, six months before 9-11, and everything then started to change very, very fast um, in terms of international pol the politics of, of Iraq, as you all very well know. And it was then another 11 years before I was able to return to, to southern Iraq again. And I am delighted to say that one of the days on my first visit back to southern Iraq was with Lamia. So I had been invited a uh, lovely nerdy conference on mathematics, and I was there to talk about ancient Babylonian mathematics. But Lamia was in Baghdad at the time, and we'd had, um, I was at that point, I had um, just become, just a few months earlier, become chair of the British Institute for the Study of Iraq. I was working a lot with her on the Visiting Scholars Program and things like this. Um, and um, one of the, uh, the, the, the very first scholar that we had when I was um, first chair was Mohammed Jawad, who was a conservator of textiles at the Iraq Museum, but was also volunteering um, at the Shrines Museums in Karbala, um, conserving carpets for them on the weekend for free. And she recognized immediately his, um, his talent, but also his ambition and his vision for what a, a longer term collaboration with the Institute could be. And so, while I was in, um, uh, in Diwaniya for the Nerdy Mathematics Conference and she was in Baghdad um, doing uh, work in the Iraq Museum, we thought this was the perfect opportunity to get together and uh, at Mohammed's invitation, uh, visit the Shrines Museums together and talk about uh, longer term relationships. And uh, in fact, uh, Dr. Allah up here, um, who you see with uh, me and Lamia and, and Lauren Malvi, our uh, former administrator, that ended up being a very uh, fruitful and long term relationship, which is still going on today. Lamia would probably um, hate me for showing her in a buyer because she really found it very annoying and, and uncomfortable. Um, but as you can see, um, nevertheless, we, ha we, we ended up having an enormous amount of fun together. So, and then my final little vignette is uh, of Lamia um, in Basra at the Basra Museum. And really, I think this stands for, a f a f um, what should have been a more recent photograph um, of her at the opening two weeks ago. I wasn't able to attend the opening either um, because I was, I was still teaching at that point, and, but hopped on a plane to Baghdad two days afterwards, as soon as my term ended, to um, do some research there. And I spent several days in the Iraq Museum last week um, doing, doing some research, helping things um, develop. And it was lovely, to, it's been a couple of years since I'd been in the museum for my own research itself, and so catching up with old friends. And I saw Dr. Ilham, who is the... Um, uh, the head of the cuneiform section. And in fact, we'd last seen each other here in London, having lunch with Lamia and Joan and Christopher and various people working on the Basra Museum project, because Ilham was here to um, co-author a catalogue of the cuneiform tablets that were going to be put on display here. And in fact, several of you, I have copies of Ilham and Christopher's book to give you. So it was lovely to see Ilham, and I said to her, how are you, you look well. She just shook her head very sadly, and she said, no. I said, oh dear, what's the matter? This is, this is terrible news. She said, I'm so sad. I said, why? And she said, I miss Lamia so much. And every conversation I had with the museum staff, the first thing they wanted to do was to talk about Lamia and how much they missed her, how much she had meant to them in the informal mentoring she gave them, the refusal to give up, the insistence that they should be their best selves at all times. And this was a theme that three or four of um, my Iraqi colleagues said to me. 
But I wanted to finish um, with the words of Qatan al-Abid himself, because when I, I, I messaged, messaged him after the um, opening of the museum to apologize for um, not, not being able to attend and to just express my condolences that they had to celebrate the opening without Lamia. Qatan wrote back, Dear Eleanor, many thanks. Everyone was in the museum. That's my feeling, especially Lamia. And for me, that, I think that just sums up Lamia's legacy. She may have gone in body, but she's with us in our hearts. And most importantly, she's, she is with Iraq, embodied in the museum in Baghdad, and particularly in, in Basra Museum now. And I think those are two outstanding physical memorials to her that will outlast us all and that's something that we should all feel uh, really proud of having contributed to helping her make those um, revived Iraq Museum and the, and the brand new Basra Museum a reality. Thank you all very much. Sorry. No, no, I'm just going to read. So, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, my recollections of Lemia Gailani Lwer are deep and unforgettable. I met Lemia in 2003 at the start of yet another Gulf War. Our families had known each other for many years, but I myself had not run into her before although I'd heard of her from many friends and acquaintances. Everybody kept telling me, what? You haven't met Lemia yet? You must meet her. And it is true that of the many Iraqis I met at that time, Lemia was probably the one that impressed me the most. This was not only because of her considerable knowledge of Iraq and Iraqi archeology, span but also because she was so down to earth. In fact, she possessed a terrific sense of humor that came in handy when confronting life's many tribulations. Needless to say, we immediately hit it off. Lemia was so easy to be with. One of my earliest memories of Lemia was meeting with her entirely by chance in the Mutanabbi district of Baghdad. She was with another Iraqi cultural icon, Mrs. Amal al khwari and several other Iraqi friends. She immediately dragged me to the Shabandar Cafe for tea, for Iraqi tea. I was initially hesitant to do so because growing up in Baghdad in the 1950s, it had always been impressed upon me that women did not enter men's coffee shops. But this was Lemia, who was forever breaking with stultifying tradition. Nothing could go wrong if she led the way. And so we sat with poets and artists and listened to ambitious plans for literary and artistic renewal Cans of Coke and 7-Up, prohibited under the Ancien Regime, flowed freely. A playwright circulated advance notice of his experimental play. This was in late 2003, before violence aborted many ideas. The air was filled with hope. I saw her again in Baghdad and in Amman, and wherever I passed by, whenever I passed by London, she made a point of picking me up in her little car, her garage's dream, she said, and taking me to see every single museum and gallery exhibit in and out of London. Lemia was the one that introduced me to Tate Modern, the Wallace Collection, Leighton House Museum, and Kenwood House. The beautiful gardens and parks of the stately homes we visited held nostalgic power for her not only because as a Gailani, she was a product of the landed nobility of Baghdad, but also because well-tended, well-watered gardens had been a long tradition among all Baghdadi families. Nowadays, I am told that due to the vicissitudes of war, these gardens, emblematic of a previous epoch in Baghdad, are almost all gone, symbols of a bygone era. Last year, when I was in New York, I toured the Metropolitan Museum a couple of times with Lemia. 
As a fellow, she had access to private elevators leading to exclusive collections that I had the great fortune to see, made all the more interesting by her company. But by far the most memorable part of my week's stay in New York was the day-long visit to the Pierpoint Morgan Library and Museum. The collection of ceramic seals housed in the Morgan was a cherished refuge, the symbol of a lifelong passion which Lemia delighted in explaining to friends that visited New York. The loss and dispersion of the seals housed in the Iraq Museum after the 2003 war hurt her deeply. And in fact, among her many diverse roles, teacher, educator, resuscitator of Iraq Museum programs and personnel, initiator and inspiration for the Basra Museum, the core of her dedication remained to those treasured ceramic seals, a particular attachment to some of the most beautiful and creative artworks ever designed in ancient Iraq. But beyond all the cultural jaunts and lunches and coffees at museums and galleries, a bond was formed to help save and perhaps re revitalize what we could of Iraqi culture. After the 2003 war, Iraq and Iraqis witnessed the radical, sometimes catastro catastrophic changes. The looting and destruction of the Iraq Museum's holdings was accompanied by the displacement of an older service-oriented elite of archeologists and museum, pers uh, museum personnel who quietly went into retirement or exile. Many of these experienced professionals could not find steady employment in post-war Iraq and consequently migrated abroad. In 2006, 2007, Lemia approached me to save, quote unquote, two excellent scholars, the late archeological pioneers, Dr. Bahija Khalil Ismail and the late Dr. Bahnam Abu Suf. At that time, I was the coordinator of the Scholar Rescue Fund Iraq program in Jordan, a program with ties to the Institute of International Education in New York. Since the SRF's mission was to rescue scholars in conflict zones by financing two or three sabbatical years at universities and institutes in countries of refuge, this was a golden opportunity to provide Iraqi scholars of great merit with asylum and shelter in troubled times. It was also a fantastic opportunity for archeologists and heritage experts in Jordan to learn from renowned experts and teachers from Iraq. And so it came to pass that even as the Jordan Museum was still but a twinkle in its founder's eyes, two highly experienced specialists in Iraqi archeology, span anthropology, and history arrived in Jordan to teach, help organize, and spread their immense knowledge of culture and heritage to archeologists in a neighboring country. And those two scholars remained in Jordan until the end of their lives. Dr. Bahnam Abu Suf passed away in Jordan in 2012, and Dr. Bahija Khalil uh, Ismail also passed away in Amman in the same month as Lemya. And then, of course, there was Lemya, the mother, the sister, the aunt, and the friend. Throughout the years that I knew her, family was paramount in Lemya's life. Mother of three exceptional daughters, one of whom, Noura, has already proven her Gailani credentials by writing an exhaustive and highly original study of two Qadari shrines in Iraq, sister to the late and irrepressible Asma, a connoisseur of antique jewelry, art, and gardens, and aunt to a set of nephews and nieces, Lemia was literally the pole around which her extended family in Jordan turned. Every trip from the UK on her way to Iraq was announced in advance. Her schedule was so heavily booked with visits to family, friends, and professional commitments that we resorted to meeting on Friday mornings for, lunch, for brunch at an Iraqi-owned restaurant in Amman, which served tashrib bagilla and gemar and dibis. There was also the matter of style. She had her very own, all bright reds and yellows and blues with magnificent scarves, kaftans, and colorful gilets. 
A true original, she was instantly recognizable wherever she went. I remember tagging along to an archaeological meet in Paris in 2009. Lemia's daughter, Noura, and I were only able to recognize Lemia among the sea of archaeologists because of her striking white hair. Lemia's legacy was twofold. On the one level, she sought the necessary international expertise and understanding that could pave the way for archaeology and culture to flourish once again in Iraq, a country with a celebrated past. And on the other, she promoted, trained, educated, and led by example the embryo of a new archaeological hierarchy in Iraq. Lemia's aim, as that of the team she inspired around her, was always to join forces with the outside world to build on the country's glorious heritage, an aim that she was in the process of fulfilling when her life was cruelly cut short. On both of these levels, the local and the international, she will leave a lasting imprint on the renaissance of Iraqi archaeology, for which she fought for practically all her life. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it's quite hard to be speaking after so many brilliant speakers already, but I will at least be brief. Uh, we've all been uniquely privileged to have known Lamia al -Giliani. She was an exceptional human being, a real people person with a deep love of her country. She's irreplaceable, both for all she has achieved for Iraq, its history and culture, and for all of us as a dear friend. A member of the distinguished Gailani family, she grew up under the Iraqi monarchy at a time when regular contact between Beirut and Baghdad was normal, as was an agreeable life in Baghdad. She spoke of sculling across the Tigris on a Kufa. While her family hoped she would lead a conventional life, Lamia had other ideas. She was one of a generation of women who were accomplished, unconventional, and original, and was the first Iraqi woman to study abroad, graduating from Cambridge. On her return, she started working in the Iraq Museum, and one of her tasks was to make impressions of cylinder seals for the museum's opening in 1966. And we saw on one of Jane Arath's wonderful slides the very same impressions and seals that Lamia had put out for that exhibition, still there, and she laughed to say, see that they, they were still as she had done them. Seals were her principal love, and she was a founder member of that distinguished seal group with Edith Parada, Barbara Parker, and Dominique, Dominique still with us, who will replace this remarkable quartet with their detailed knowledge of this miniature art form. Lamia was passionate about Iraqi archaeology and was actively training young Iraqis even on the day before she died, because she knew they were the future of Iraq. She had friends everywhere, and one of her many activities was keeping everyone informed. While living in beautifully sited Valley Drive with the foxes, her extensive contacts meant that she always knew what was going on where. For instance, she kept in touch with Mazahim, or the museum in Mosul, throughout the occupation by ISIS. Wonderful for them to hear her voice, to know they were not forgotten through that nightmare. How now will all of us know what's happening? Lamia was incredibly generous with her time. In addition to her considerable academic achievements, her raison d'etre was to help people, smoothing their paths with suitable introductions. I had the privilege of joining her for a wonderful fortnight when she was invited to Baghdad for a celebration during Saddam's time. This was a period when it was difficult to get visas, as it often was, the visit couldn't be longer than a fortnight, 
as the restrictions of the time meant that if she hadn't left by that time, she wouldn't be able to get an exit visa and would have had to stay. Being a gay Lani opened many doors, even, I discovered, with the Jordanian-Iraqi customs on the border as we traveled to Baghdad by bus. We were waved through once they knew she was a gay Lani. Being with Lamia, our fortnight was action-packed. We were some of the time in the museum. We went south to see Donny George, alas no more, excavating near Nasiriyah. He was digging, surrounded by armed guards and toting a gun himself. And we went north to Mosul and Nimrud, being taken round by Muzahin. As we passed Samara, she even made me put on a chador and enter the shrine. I was a bit nervous. Lamia was fundamental to the success of my Nimrud Ivory project. One day in the museum, she saw a pile of photographs on the floor about to be thrown away. She scooped them up. They were spare prints of the fantastic ivories found by the Iraqis in Well AJ in the Northwest Palace. These are some of the finest and most complete ivories ever found and have revolutionized ivory studies. Thanks to these photographs and with the uh, agreement of the Iraq Museum, they formed an important part of ivories from Nimrud VI, ivories from the Northwest Palace. This volume included the first ivories found by Layard in 1845, through those found by Max Mallowan from 1949 to 53, to the great Iraqi discoveries of 1986 and 1992. Lamia also arranged for me to study some of these pieces in the hand. Life with Lamia was always varied and fun. She found time to take groups of friends on wonderful holidays. One memorable one was to North Syria, where her friends in Aleppo welcomed us to their house and feasted us with the most fantastic food. Alas, that was my last visit to that magical city. We traveled in a minibus to Crack, Saladin's Castle, Latakia, and those wonderful deserted towns near Ain Dara, among much else. Despite the dreadful hammer blows that kept pulverizing her beloved country and never seemed to stop, Lamia never gave up. She returned to Iraq every year, whatever the conditions, to bring supplies of books and equipment, and also, very important, chocolate. And perhaps most important of all, courage and contact. She wanted to be a witness. She wanted people to know about what was happening. She was a tireless ambassador, traveling and lecturing widely, fighting for the history and culture of her people. She was working on two books in her last months. She never stopped. May she rest in peace. So let me get this right, because I'm not very tall. <laughs> um, what a wonderful evening to be all together. Um, I have to confess that mine's going to be a bit longer than some because I'm doing it for three people. I'm doing it for Mesun al Damluji and Katan al Bid, as well as myself, and for all of us. Um, so, also, thank you. So, oh no. <laughs> I'll, I'll give it a try. Um, thank you to Noura and Hissen for allowing us to do this with them because without their support, this would not have happened. And I'd also like to thank Ali Khadr very much for all the organizing that he's done this evening. So, Lamia. You will have already heard a mixture of presentations from everybody. There's only one photograph that I'm gonna show. It'll be your test to see whether you remember it, but you can't forget it because it's one of the best. <laughs> and I would say that this picture here represents part of Lamia's Amman life. This is at the Dar al Fanun taken by Zainab Bahrani and part of the crowd from the Metropolitan Museum because not only did she help us, busy friends of Boston Museum, she also ran the programs for the Metropolitan Museum and for Columbia in Amman. 
And so I thought when they sent me this photo, it was a photo that maybe some people haven't seen, some of the other ones you will have seen. So how can, how can I talk about the work she's done? Without her, we would not have the programs we did. Um, Harriet Crawford was the chair at the beginning in 2003, after the invasion, and with Lamia, we created the Visiting Scholars Program. I would say that in the early days, it wasn't perhaps the most um, organized of programs. Lamia would say, you should take so-and-so and so-and-so, and we would say yes. Um, later on, it did become much more organized. She didn't go wrong, though, in her choices. All the people that she chose, some of them actually now are still involved in other things. Um, I am showing just one, one group. This is actually in my house, and um, I used to invite many of the visiting scholars, and Lamy would often come with them. But on, you can see in the middle is Katan Alabid, and this was in the early stages when he first came to England. In 2008, when he first, first came, his English was minimal. Well, probably some of you have heard him speak and, and deliver lectures all over the world, including at UNESCO and to um, ICMOS and things like that. But without um, the start back then in 2008 and John Curtis originally bringing him, it wouldn't happen. Now, we're all doing a mixture of personal and anecdotes. And some of you actually know me as Joan Porter McKeever, and some of you know me as Dr. Barbara Porter. And the first, the first kiss I ever got from Lamia was for Dr. Barbara Porter. And um, Jane, uh, Jane said to me, oh, I met you in Amman. And I said, well, actually, Jane, we haven't met before. And um, Lamia always used to love to tell the story because it was Dominique who introduced us. So I've only known her 20 years. And th that seems, indeed, like Eleanor says, quite minuscule. But as we all know, knowing Lamia for a year would be like knowing her for a lifetime. So I'm not reading off all the things that I've written. Um, these are sort of aid memoirs to some of the ideas that she did. But um, just in September, um, she hosted Dr. Elham from the Iraq Museum at her house with Hissen, and they had her for a whole month. And I would say it was a wonderful experience for Dr. Elham. She won, learned through people at the British Museum, like Angie, who's at the back, how hard everybody works. She went back, and when she got to the Iraq Museum, she said, right, I'm going to start a committee. We're going to talk every week about what we need to do and do the tasks. And without Lamia's example of how you could actually do things, that never would have happened. Uh, we had over 35 scholars, and we're still having more scholars. You can read that I've said um, you know, Eleanor's uh, project with the Nakarin Network has enabled us to bring more scholars. Um, it's quite active. Um, we have our Visiting Scholars Coordinator here, and I have to say I'm extremely grateful because I used to be the Visiting Scholars Coordinator, and I know how much work it is. So, Isabel, thank you very much. So, you all heard about this, um, but I thought you might like to see a picture of Professor uh, Postgate and Professor Math Matthews and Dr. Crawford, all there, all, all former chairman of the British School of Archaeology in Iraq, and then also the British Institute for the Study of Iraq. And this is where she's getting this at UCL. She deserved it. Um, I can make a great confession. I did have the ins inscription down at the back. And as others have pointed out, Lamia will tell you off. She said, you didn't have a very good engraver. <laughs> so sorry, Lauren. <laughs> sorry. So many loves. The Gertrude Bell Conference, the, um, she was involved in. And through that conference, she had already started doing her research that you saw those wonderful pictures from Jane. I, I actually have to say I love those pictures. Um, and here she is in the, in, in, in the front row, and you have you know, Eleanor and many others who were involved, and Saad Iskander, who was with the Iraq National Archive, and, and the book, which she has an article in. Um, I have to say that I do have access to some of these, um, uh, this, this material, and I just love looking at it. And there she is giving the lecture. Two years ago here, in November, she gave a lecture to all of us on on the Iraq Museum, and that is on our website. So if you want to listen to it, I would highly recommend it. It's actually very good. Um, she talks about it quite a bit. So one of the things that happened in that conference, which was in this very same room, it was the prelude to this film called Letters from Baghdad. It's still available on BBC iPlayer, but we're also having a screening here on the 15th of May, should you wish to come. But anyway, those two women at the side are um, Ziva and Sabina, who are, were the co-directors. And when they came to this conference, the opportunity to meet Lamia and others inspired them to do this film, which took five years to do. 
And she was a special advisor, along with Charles Tripp on this film, the National Endowment of Humanities. She was one of the people who recommended them to get some of the grant money that they did. Um, when the film had its preview also in this room in London as a private screening, Lamine and I were there, and then there was wonderful opportunities later on to do questions and answers. If you haven't seen the film, please do, because it is quite remarkable. And it also focuses on the work, and quite a lot of the archival, some of the archival photo is, are from Lamia, but they did an extraordinary job themselves. And then we had, I had fun going with Lamia to the parliament when they had a special screening with Lord Renfrew and others. So, Boston Museum, I mean, Busy was major, but Boston Museum obviously was from John and Angie and Claire Bevington, and there are quite a few trustees, and also Hugo wasn't there at the beginning of the, as a trustee, but there are many trustees who are here today, the friends of Boston Museum. In doing this presentation, um, I went through uh, all my files with Lamia's name, and there were about 3,000 um, on, my, on my computer, and there were about, um, 3,000 emails as well, <laughs> um, as you all know from your own email trails. So um, these, as you can see, one similar picture, um, and I do agree with Eleanor, the picture of Lamia looking like the movie star in the middle is the one I prefer myself to. But you can see how she looked in front of everybody um, on the stage, and all, indeed all at the second opening or the final opening of the galleries. She was uh, remembered by everybody. Um, now, I, at the end of this, I'll be reading from Mesun Dabluji. You can see Mesun next to Katan in the top one, and then you can see down below with John. Um, and um, these were, I think Lamia was remembered in our hearts throughout this whole, whole time. So she also not only did involved with the choosing of the objects, but she also was involved in two major training programs, and Nora was there. Um, the one on the left, I'm just quickly going to say, we arrived in Basra. Uh, Paul was the starting uh, feature of the program. He was in a sandstorm going over Kuwait. Another colleague of Nora's was supposed to be there, didn't come. So what were we going to do for the beginning session? Well, guess what? We pulled the rabbit out of the hat, and Lamia gave her presentation on the Iraq Museum. And I thought, why didn't we think of that first? Because, I mean, it was amazing. And she, she was actually telling them about the history of their museum and how it grew and how other museums grew. And it was fabulous. You can see Ali in the corner. He's trying to catch up on some of his work. And Katan in the back also. Uh, it was a six-day training program. And then later on, um, just last December, we also did a, a training time with John there working on signage and labels. And that is to be continued, hopefully, with... Paul and Noor and John as well later on. So the Boston Museum is a thing of beauty. Um, you should all go, and you can. But you can see that the cylinder seal, she did make sure that she um, had a, a few things. And Katan, by hand, got local clay, and he was the one who rolled them out and had them baked. I love this, the picture up above, which isn't that great, but it shows Lamia giving a little lecture to Katan, which and when you hear what I have to say from him, you'll see he's very apt. So the last days. Um, my twin sister, Barbara Porter, uh, is the director of the American Center of Oriental Research, and that was where Lamia was giving her presentations to the curators from throughout Iraq. Um, on Friday, I received a call from Katan, and he said, Lamia, is, have you heard? And I said, no, I have to talk to Barbara yesterday, it's a snow day in Amman, she's not turning up. He said, well, in the, in the Iraq Museum, they're saying that something's happened. And I said, not possible. So I called, and I called Nora, and Nora let me know. And, well, my husband is here tonight, he will let you know how long I cried and how long we've all cried. Uh, it was very, very hard. But um, in the day before, she was there talking to these curators from all over. This was the Metropolitan Museum Columbia program. This, picture is from, from my sister. Um, and then, of course, we all know about the procession from the museum to the shrine, and that photo is the one that is with us. So I'm going to read from Mesun. Um, I'm going to leave this up. You can read that. Um, Mesun Gambluji um, not only was a close friend, but of course is very involved in the Iraqi um, government. So this is from Mesun, who we'd hoped to be also a speaker tonight. An Iraqi political leader once asked Lamia in my presence, were you in the 60s a communist or a nationalist? 
She immediately answered, neither. The only political leader I ever trust is Hammurabi. <laughs> it was quite hard to have a conversation with Lamia on any topic without her referring to Mesopotamian history. To her, it wasn't just a passion, but also a contagious style of life. Anyone who was close to Lamia ended up obsessed with archaeology and all that came with it, including illicit trafficking, legis legislature, and shortcomings of archaeological management in Iraq. Having walked with Lamia around the halls of both the Iraq Museum and the Assyrian section of the British Museum several times, I found she was not only extremely informed of the exhibits, but also had incredible tales of the digs and the journey some of the pieces took before they ended up in the museum. Her wealth of knowledge always amazed me. Personally, I'm in debt to Lamia in more than one way. She and her late husband, George, were among the first people I contacted when I went to London to study architecture in 1981. Lamia was also the first person to guide me when I took the post of Deputy Minister of Culture in Iraq in 2003. She was always a warm, supportive, and encouraging friend without any hesitation to criticize when criticism was due. Finally, I was honored to take part in the opening of the Basra Museum a few weeks ago, which was one of Lamia's deep passions in recent years. She worked extremely hard for many years to raise funding for this project, um, support and train the curators and enrich the shelves with valuable exhibits. She would have been so proud of this achievement. Her spirit will always remain around it. So in this picture, I want to just highlight the library that is going to be created this year through the Friends of Boston Museum and the British Institute for the Study of Iraq. And when I asked Lamia what she thought, was it a good idea to do a library? She said, of course, we must have a library. And it's very, very important. And at our recent meeting with the workshop, um, it was clear that the museum library would be for research and for scholars, but we would also want to make sure that the children would not be forgotten. So there will be an extending space to a learning center and things like that. So I would like to now read from Katan, whom I spoke to yesterday, Katan al Um You can all have heard through all these talks how important he is to all this process. So Katan told me yesterday, I could not have done this project without Lamia who understood me and my vision of the museum. When I insisted on having cases that could withstand earthquakes, everyone laughed. And Lamia said, good idea, do it. Lamia was the person who gave me the passion for my work and shared many ideas. She inspired and pushed me and was behind me all the way. She changed my life. We were often of the same mind, but had different techniques, and I had my technical experience. Working with her on the selection of objects in Baghdad within the committee was difficult, and without her, we would not have what we do. She will be with us forever, and I think we all feel the same. Thank you very much. So I'd like to thank all our speakers this afternoon for uh, engaging us with some incredible memories of, of Lamia. Um, and now it's an opportunity for really you to talk among yourselves and recall your own memories of this remarkable woman. I invite you to step next door and continue our memorial and tribute to Lamia al Galaniwa. Thank you.